coming this evening, and welcome. This evening's special lecture by uh, Professor Raphael Sachs is entitled Processes of Products. You can see behind me, and you can see the longer title, which I won't read out. But my name is Tom Cavan. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. I'd like to begin, as I always do, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Wurundjeri, and pay respect to their elders and families, past and present. This is the fourth and final Dean's Lecture for the series of this year, 2012. It's our intention in these Dean's Lectures to provide you with an opportunity to gain international perspective on key issues regarding the built environment and to our contributing disciplines in which we teach and conduct research. This year, our range of international speakers have delved into issues of urban development, landscape architecture, architecture and urbanism, and now in construction delivery. We're all aware of the, um, that in the construction industry, the major component of a national economy, about 8% of the Australian economy, I believe, we're also aware that it faces significant challenges in coming years as costs and conditions of on-site labor become ever more um, significant and larger components of project financial modeling. So Australia has led in many ways this industry and the, with its focus on quality, safety, and cost. But the focus, I think, will get more acute over coming years. And therefore, we have to become more innovative. And it's for that reason that we're very pleased this evening that we are joined by Professor Raphael Sachs, who's head of structural engineering and construction management at the Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Technion in Haifa in Israel. Professor Sachs is considered by many to be the leading thinker across the world in the fields of BIM and lean construction. These issues are driving fundamental change in construction industry everywhere, including here on some recent and current large projects. Professor Sachs is a significant voice in the development and direction of BIM and lean delivery. He's established and led the BIM and Virtual Construction Laboratories in Technion's National Building Research Institute since 2003, and he's co-author of the BIM Handbook. In his presentation, he'll draw upon the key principles of BIM and lean construction and how they interact, drawing upon examples and recent developments in research and practice from projects in the US, in Finland, and in Israel. While theory is essential in framing our understanding, it's the application that's essential and key. And Professor Sachs has played a major part in this translation. Together with his doctoral students, for example, and his eminent colleague in the area of BIM, Professor Charles Eastman, um, he has developed the principles for fully pa parametric three-dimensional modeling of precast concrete and developed various um, systems that control workflow and also, more importantly, through game technology and games, introduce students into the theory and application of these ideas. So we'll be hearing about that this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sachs. Um, well, thank you, Professor Kavana, and um, thank you to all who have had a hand in uh, bringing me out here and, and organizing the trip, particularly to uh, Rosanna, who we've shared so many emails over the past time to prepare. So thank you very much. Um, I'll try to paint a picture for you of the uh, work that we do, and especially the experimental work, because um, I think that in construction management, often the challenge is that construction projects are very difficult to experiment with. No one project is quite like any other, and so it's very difficult to do the experiment and control uh, paradigm. And um, perhaps that's the area that I've found most challenging and interesting to try to, uh, to deal with. So. Um, Exactly as you said, perhaps, construction industry is thought to be underperforming, problematic, deficient, uh, I should say deficient production management. But the fact is that we have very complex products and we have very complex processes that go along with making those products. And the organizations are very dispersed and fragmented. 
But we also have tremendous opportunity in building construction nowadays, both because of lean and of building modeling. And so those are the real areas that over the what, 15, 20 years I've begun to specialize in, and particularly in the synergies and the meeting points between them. Just by way of a very quick introduction to the virtual construction lab, we really hope to try to study and experiment. Uh, the experimental work is a, f a central part of what we do. Um, and then there are the foci on, on both Lean and on BIM, as, as you can see for yourselves. Uh, a lot of it has to do with observations, action research embedded in construction companies, uh, process mapping and so on, and, and management simulation games and computer simulations. Within the BIM technology sites, we're quite involved in, in the industry foundation classes and IFC development. And um, BIM education, perhaps, is a key thing more recently. And then in the, um, in the most recent work, and I think the work that I want to focus on this evening, the work, this experimental work in the virtual construction site that we've put together. So one of the key tools that we use is this um, virtual reality cave. And um, we're able within it to recreate construction sites, but in ways that allow us to control many of the parameters and only um, change those parameters that we're interested in researching. Uh, and so within the cave of this kind, you can really recreate any kind of virtual environment. And we have now three or four uh, buildings, but it's not only the building, as you'll see toward the end. It's really the uh, organization and process that sit behind that project. Um, much of flow line and line of balance uh, theory and, and practice was developed in Australia, and so I'm not telling in those who are familiar with this anything new, but I will be using in the presentation a number of times um, line of balance charts. And so I just wanted to emphasize that while this might be your typical Gantt chart uh, with uh, activities and time down the bottom, the way that I'll be presenting a lot of the projects and the processes will be in this way, where we have uh, time again across the bottom, but we have locations. And so the work of the teams over here is represented by lines that uh, represent the flow of teams through the projects. And uh, you, you could parallel that with a gang chart by saying that that's the time that a work team of that trade would be spending in that location. So I just wanted to put that so as a term of reference so some of the slides will be a little more um, understandable. So we have a lot of problems with construction management. The fear of risk and inability to control it, which leads to fragmentation, and various layers of subcontracting, to not just to divide up the work and specialize, but also to defer the risk down to lower levels until it reaches those who are least able to deal with it, of course. Uh, we manage by dividing into parts. We manage by contracts on the whole. And of course, this is a little stereotypical, but, but it does describe the vast majority of traditional construction uh, around the world. And, and we're, I think most of us are familiar with these sort of endemic problems of coordination among trades, uh, this kind of thing where the guys designing the duct were not aware that the concrete beam would be there and it all had to be changed and adapted on site. Or this one where um, I asked students this morning in a, in a class on prefabrication what the problem was here. And uh, it took a few moments, but very soon someone said, ah, they've drilled through the concrete wall here to put the saw blades through to be able to cut out the, the hole in the 30 centimeter concrete wall to put in the, the two meter by 80 centimeter duct that somebody forgot about when designing the concrete wall for fabrication. So these problems are really very common in, and we're ridden with rework and the expenses of doing that. And on the other hand, on the other hand, not only in specific cases of problems and errors, we have these kind of analyses that you can do on just about any construction trade where you see this analysis of all the partitions in an apartment. And the analysis says, uh, a work study, students sit at the site, they watch and measure what people are doing out, uh, every 10 minutes in record. And you see in the end that actually building the blocks block on block is only 30 something percent of the time that they're working. And all the other time is taken up with cutting blocks and scaffolding and cleaning and changes and corrections and, and a whole host of other things that don't actually produce value. And, People, you know, people have done this all around the world, and this is one of the aspects of lean construction that we look at the work that's being done and try to identify what's 
adding value and what's not. And that leads to rethinking about how the blocks should be delivered, how they should be designed, how they should be packaged, and a range of things to make the work itself more productive. And so if we look back in history a little, not that long ago, um, the Empire State Building built from start to finish, including design, in just 410 working day, in 410 calendar days. And so you ask yourself, how was that possible? The equivalent building today, the Freedom Tower that's being built in New York City, it's been going for quite a while and it's not done. Uh, we're, what, 11 years after 9-11, and we're still not done. I had a student look into this, and so she uh, looked up the 100 tallest buildings in the world. This was completed in 2008 around. So she looked up the 100 tallest buildings in the world and said, well, how long did they take and how tall are they? And by a rough measure of either floors, uh, number of floors built per year or number of square meters built per year, and you map it out and you put in a, a trend line, very simple, then you see that for whatever reason, the, the pace or the rate of construction is slowing down. Now, you might say, well, if we extend that line, eventually we'll stop building altogether because we'll reach the zero. <laughs> Uh, but, but obviously, it's perhaps asymptotic in some way. Uh, but, but perhaps, actually, we can fix this in some way as well. Well, so then, of course, this begs the question, well, why? What's, what's the problem? There are a range of possible explanations, and they deal with things like uh, people say, well, the Great Depression, there was lots of labor, labor was very cheap. No, it's not really the case, because two years before, they were building similar buildings at similar rates. When, when the economy was booming and labor was expensive. But what they did have was two things. They had a very simple building, simple straight up and down with very few systems within the building. But they also had a very good understanding of flow within the construction. And most of the engineers working on the project were people who were schooled in um, Henry Ford's uh, mass production and so on. And so they had very good concept understandings of how materials and people should flow through the building. Uh, and we're able to create that. And I'll come back to that. But really what we have nowadays is we have much more complex buildings. Uh, this is a, the service, one of the service floors of a building in Hong Kong, an 80-story tower. And you, I'm not going to dwell on it and explain your system, but I think just the visual image is striking. Uh, the same goes here for a, a building from the United States. It's a hospital in Castro Valley in California where they're replacing almost the entire stock of hospitals. And so you can see that the number of systems and the complexity of those systems and the, the need for coordination between them all has become far more uh, intense than it was at the time of the Empire State Building. Um, this is a building that we worked with uh, in uh, 2008 and 2009 in, in London. And again here, three stories were filled with machine rooms and so on equipment. And they were all co coordinated with uh, building modeling. None of these buildings could really have been built in efficient ways without uh, the clash checking and the other facilities that we're now fairly familiar with in the industry. But the point I want to make about it, perhaps, is that it's not just the product that's complex. It's the organizations that grow up in order to build that building that are complex. And so in this rug maker office building, it's only a 22-story tower. It's not anything too radical. Uh, it was a, um, a managed construction project, so May saw a construction manager who served as a GC. And they uh, subcontracted the different packages. So they had, for example, the mechanical package. And the interesting thing is that within the mechanical package, in the first tier of sub subcontractors, if you like, there were 20 separate subcontractors. And they each employed different work teams on a subcontractual basis. And that's only the mechanical package. Within the site offices, they had some 70 people sitting around desks who each of them was a manager of one particular company uh, involved and responsible for teams of, of workers. So the organizations have become more complex. And yet we're still working with mental models of construction that use the critical path method. We build networks, we plan them out, we solve the critical path and so on. We build the grant charts and we hope that that's going to work. But the, the truth is that the projects don't really look like that. This entirely ignores all the waiting time and the interfaces between the black boxes of the, of the tasks. And so the real world looks a little bit more like this, where if, that were, if we think of that as a project, then there are all these supply chains feeding into the project, and most of those are happening off the site. 
and they're preparing, they're designing, they're fabricating, they're uh, doing analysis of various kinds, and they're all feeding in, and eventually they're all applying their work and their labor to the uh, project, and the project's actually being built. But then if you think a little bit further, each of those subcontractors are probably working on more than one project at a time. And so they're juggling their labor and their, whether it be a design firm or a contractor, between all those projects. And so the real world actually looks something like this. So we have all these different projects. And in fact, they're all competing for the same resources. They're sharing resources, but sometimes that sharing is not so friendly. And uh, so we end up with subcontractors who behave in a particular way. And some of that behavior begins to help us understand why projects uh, have become so much longer in time. Uh, for example, if I were to ask you, I, I know we have many construction professionals in, in, in the hall. If I were to ask you, a project manager requests 10 workers from a subcontractor uh, for the next week of electrical work in a project to meet the planned production demand. And so he rings up and he says, oh, Joe, I need next week 10 workers for electrical. How many workers does Joe bring on Monday morning? Well, three, four. Generally, what, what the subcontractors are doing, they're trying to have a feel for the reliability of the plan on the construction project. And if it's reliable, they'll bring workers because they can be productive. And if it's not, they're not going to bring their workers. They're going to send the, the pioneers to check it out and then see if the production rates can be maintained. So we did a bit of work on, uh, on this level using economic game theory. And without going into all the intricacies of it, I just will point out the bottom line, more or less. You can, in the, model, in the game theory modeling, you can put together different permutations and so on. But our basic question was to make it simple and say, we have some reality that such and such percent of the planned work will actually become available. In response to that, the project manager is going to demand labor according to the production plan, and they have the option of demanding exactly what they think is required. They also have the option of demanding less or of demanding more. But then the subcontractor here also has the option to bring fewer laborers, or supply fewer labor, or more, or exactly what was demanded. And, and you, you work out all the different permutations, you build the tables, and then you can find out where the equilibrium situation is. And in this case, when you work out the utilities, the economic utilities, these are all the same, but over here, this is nature, the project manager strategy, the subcontractor. But what I want to emphasize here is this. The, the utilities for the subcontractor are nine, three, and minus three. Any right-minded subcontractor who's in the business to make money, and they all should be, is going to choose that option. That option is always bring fewer labor than you're demanded to bring. Where does the, where does the PM, it turns out, where's the, where's the equilibrium? The equilibrium is when the PM says, oh, I know those subs. If I ask for 10, they're going to bring eight. I'll ask for 12. And then maybe they'll bring 10. And so we have this game going on of demanding more, bringing fewer, and, and working itself up. But the fundamental thing that's happening is that it's all dependent on the reliability of the work, the reliability of the plan. If the plan is reliable and the subcontractor knows that the work promised will actually become available for their teams, they will respond by bringing more workers because, after all, then they produce more and earn more money. If they sense that the production plan is unreliable, they bring fewer people. And so you can map out, and we've done that afterwards, plan reliability compared to information quality, and you find that these are the cases here where plan reliability is high, and the information is, the designs are coordinated and correct. You begin to get the best situations and the best equilibria between management and supply of labor. Um, and then there's this other aspect, this thing of the, the race for space. Um, a mechanical subcontractor wants to be the first to install systems in the ceiling of new laboratory buildings because that's most productive, because nobody else is interfering with them. So they generally have this approach, where do they work when the structural work in each floor is complete? Well, they'll go and fill out the spaces and, and find virgin territory to begin laying out so I can grab it and work peacefully without other trades interfering with me. But that's not necessarily what the construction plan wants them to do. So they're doing one thing, and this game, again, is going on. If you think of these two strategies, just two of the possible ones, place a higher priority on occupying new spaces or placing a higher priority on completing spaces, then when you map it out and you do the simulations, 
Here are two options. These are the start dates for doing work, and these are the finish dates for doing work in each of a number of floors of a building. This is the location and the duration, like I showed before. And you can see here that if you have this policy of opening up space as soon as possible, you tend to begin earlier and finish later. So you're occupying more of the building. Whereas if you have the stricter policy of closing out spaces and handing them over to other trades, then you end up with the red. And you can see that the cycle times here are much shorter for each floor. And the quantity of work in progress is shorter. So there is a real difference between these different policies. Uh, how does that play out? Well, the way it plays out is that if you think of the, the parade of trades through the spaces, then trades are dependent one on the other. And so if there's some preceding and following activity, here is the black policy, the, the occupy the spaces. And here is the other one. And you can see that the rates are slower, but the finish dates are much earlier. And you get much better flow when you're handing over spaces more quickly from one to the other, and you're placing emphasis on finishing and closing out spaces than you are on occupying the building and dragging out the project. Um, a lot of this has been studied, and, and a lot of it has brought out these ideas that the, really, the underlying theory of project management is obsolete. And Larry Koskela and Greg Howell are, are strong proponents of the thinking. Um, there are some alternative theories that have been proposed. There's the, the um, transformation flow and value theory that Koskela has developed. Uh, the theory of constraints, Goldratt's theory of constraints of production in manufacturing is in many ways applicable in, in these kind of projects. And there is the, the, the factory physics, which gives a very good understanding of production. And it's when you begin dealing with these that you start to understand at a slightly better level the ways in which, not even subtle, the, the, the strong ways we can influence how construction runs. Um, and the other problem is that we're using the wrong tools to a large extent. 2D projections and drawings are just not good enough anymore for the complexity of buildings that we're building. Uh, the critical path method itself is very limited. And uh, it's limited in many ways. The activity durations are not determined, well, real activity durations are not deterministic. And uh, they're distributed. Some would say perhaps in some stochastic way. There is research that shows, in fact, that they can be chaotic and not even given to some kind of modeling through distribution. But probably one of the most important things is they tend to ignore the interfaces between trades. They focus on the activity itself in CPM, but we ignore what happens in between. And especially the handovers between trades, the interfaces, that's where all the problems are. There's a famous saying that says, buildings leak at the interfaces between the trades, at the handovers between activity and activity. Um, so again, back to the Empire State Building, completed in 410 days. But when we went back and studied it and took the, the, the uh, site diaries are available, and you can do fairly in-depth analysis of how the building was built on the schedules. No critical path in the sense that they had the, uh, this is the line of balance chart, and you can, I won't go into the technical detail of it, but each color represents a different trade. And you can see that there are significant points where there are buffers that were allowed to build up and they were planned. And wherever there were trades that were less stable and less predictable, they introduced buffers to protect the following trades. And in that way, they were able to neutralize the instability and keep the project stable and keep the flow going. And you can see that pretty much from beginning to end, they were able to keep that going up the 88 stories of, of office space. And so without critical path tools, they weren't invented yet. But quite apart from that, they did not have a continuous critical path through the project. So now we're thinking, well, we need the right tools for production system design, for buffer planning, for location-based management, and so on. And um, really, these are challenges, all these things, for Lean and for BIM. And, and these are the ways and the areas where um, these two developments can begin to bear fruit and have an impact. So for, in, a, in a very broad uh, problem statement that I would in a retro retrospective problem statement, I would say that for our lab and our research that we've taken on is this. Uh, finishing and interior works in particular exhibit all these problems. Uh, so the question becomes, 
can workflow and product flow can be improved by developing, calibrating, and applying rules and tools at the operational level, on the construction site especially, in dispatching construction works. Uh, and that's really the hypothesis that we're trying to test, whether we can do that and improve the flow of work through buildings and begin to approach the uh, economies that once were known, despite modern buildings being complex. Well, one of the main developments in this area uh, around the world is the development of the, the last planner system, which is actually a very simple tool. It's almost, most people who learn it, they say, oh, well, that's obvious, isn't it? It's, but, but until you actually begin applying it in practice and you see how it actually works, it's, it's surprising what an impact it has on the way that people work. And it's three main elements that we can have a look at are the master scheduling, the look-ahead planning, and the weekly work planning. Uh, and, and it is becoming far more common in, in many places around the world. Um, one of the things I would emphasize is that it introduces this idea of making work ready, and it introduces the role of management being servants of the production workers, and servants in the sense that their role becomes to prepare and mature the work so that the work can be done right the first time without rework, without waiting, without problems of flow. And it's achieved largely by uh, careful screening, preparation, and selection of work in the weekly work plan, work that is ready and mature, and not assigning work that is not ready. So it's mu very much about what we call pull flow and not about pushing work. But it has a number of limitations. Um, there is a measure in last planner called percent plan complete, which is a measure of how good the planning is or how stable the production plan is. And it turns out that in almost all projects, a level of 80 to 85% is considered wonderful. And why can't we reach 100% planning credibility or, or accuracy? Well, there's still some uncertainty. And uh, the residual uncertainty within the planning window, within the week or the 10 days of the planning window, still remains. Things still go wrong. There's another way of saying that, that politeness doesn't allow me right now, but you get the idea. Um, the flow of work at the last planner level, another problem is it's not really pulled. And so this idea of closing out spaces is not really taken care of. That, that pull flow is not done. And the last is that there really are difficulties in implementation. They, they've found, for example, in companies like Skanska, which are worldwide, uh, companies that operate worldwide, that they introduce the systems, they bring it out across their hundreds of projects, and after two or three years, after intense training and so on, they'll come back and they'll find that everything's back to normal, back to the old way of doing things, because it requires effort. It requires effort, consistent effort on the part of project managers, superintendents, site supervisors, contractors, and so on. This, this thing, this notion of uncertainty during the project, during the, the within the window, uh, has to do with this, that even after you do the weekly work planning, there are these go, no-go decisions. We check the task is mature for next week, Wednesday came, we're out on the site, the floor tiles arrived, and they're wrong. They're the wrong tiles. What do we do? Do we, floor, do we tile with those floors? Do we bring floors from the f tiles from the floor above? Do we make some kind of um, compromise? Well, these things happen, and sometimes the improvisation goes wrong, but sometimes the improvisation can bring value. And many construction projects, many construction companies value project managers who are able to firefight and solve problems. They thrive on uncertainty and instability because then they're challenged, and then they can prove themselves. Well, it's not a great way to run an industry on the long term. And then we have this additional problem, which we call re-entrant flow. And re-entrant flow is this idea that jobs or work cycles again and again through particular workstations. And it's very common in the semiconductor industry. They have these uh, wafers that go through different processes of, of etching and, and filling and, and so on, and they come back because they have a number of layers on the, on the wafers to make the chips, so they come back to the same machines in repeated cycles. And there is a wealth of literature in the operations research about how you cope with that. And it turns out that we have exactly the same patterns in construction because, for example, in finishing works, if you're doing drywalls and you're doing the first side and then you're waiting for the electricians and the plumbers to come and fill in their systems and then you're coming back to close the other side of that, that partition, then you have exactly this notion that if you think of the product, the apartment or the office or whatever, it's coming to the drywall workstation, it's going to some other workstations and then it's coming back to the drywall team. And when you... Uh, model those out and, and try to understand how they impact big projects, 
a PhD student worked in this project for six months, and uh, it's two residential towers in Tel Aviv, and um, she observed these different uh, activities over the period, and, and then built a simulation model. And the simulation model modeled this uh, 280 apartments, and so you have uh, up here 120 of the apartments, the locations and the time, and then these are the different trades, the, the drywall and the plumbing and the electrician and, and so on. Here's the striking thing. When you model it without any sophistication, you say, well, we'll just bring a certain number of crews and they'll begin working. As soon as the drywall reach here and the first apartments are finished, plumbing and electrical work, those drywall crews are called back down to begin closing out those apartments, which are, they're therefore withdrawn from there and they begin working there. And so you begin to see these batching, big batches of apartments and the, the work is really quite disrupted if you ignore those, that re-entry flow effect. And so within the simulation models, we were able to test out different policies of assigning crews and assigning work to the crews. And when you begin doing what we call pool product control, that means um, doing the work only when the designs are mature and adjusting teams, you begin to, you still get some of this batching, but you can see that workflows are much smoother and the interruptions to crews is much less simply by changing the policies of allocation. And the same again when you run uh, what we call pool process control. And so you really can have an impact. Th this chart simply shows the, uh, the labor requirements of the different trades. And so they're up and down, and, th and there's not really a stability in the labor. And again, when you do the better systems, you're able to smooth them out a lot more, which is obviously desirable. So why would we use BIM for production management. Well, and, and really we, we tend to think of BIM as an activity, a building information modeling rather than, than, a, than, a, than the model itself, uh, which I'll more refer to as the building model. Well, some principles of lean construction. Reducing variability, reducing cycle time, some of the things I've mentioned. Um, design and decide by consensus, et cetera, visual management, and so on. I mean, you'll be able to read these. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on them for the moment. But you can list them out and be very specific about each one, about the, the ways that you can implement them. And you can do the same thing with uh, building modeling. There we go. Uh, some of the main functionalities of building modeling, uh, visualization of form, rapid generation of alternatives, parametric modeling, and, and so on. And you can do the same thing here you can list out for each of those major principles the different functionalities. And so in doing that, in a, in a collaborative research with, uh, with Larry Koskela, we then mapped them out and we sat down and said, okay, we have these lean principles, we have these BIM functionalities, how do they interact? And by putting them in a matrix and then going and looking at each cell and spending some time considering each cell and looking for the examples within projects, within industry, uh, we try to determine where there were positive interactions and where there were negative ones. What that really means is that using these features or abilities of building modeling, you achieve lean goals. Or vice versa, if you want to achieve some of these lean goals, you can employ building modeling in these particular ways. And as you can see, there were 54 positive interactions and I think six three or four negative interactions. Some of the negative interactions, for example, uh, building modeling makes it very easy to produce drawings quickly and in great volume. That tends to encourage designers to produce big batches of drawings, which is really anathema to smooth flow of information. I mean, we can think of a lot of examples. And just picking on some of those cells, reducing design cycle time. These are from a precast project in the US. So in previous times, it required 80 days. In the BIM process, they do it now in 34 days. What it being preparing the shop drawings for the pieces for, for a precast uh, parking garage. Um, and so the short product cycle times and so on are the benefit. In another project, we tried to see whether in the BIM world, we could actually track the flow of information between designers. And so whether using a common platform for saving their files, and then they're uploading and downloading model files, uh, we measure the number of information packets or objects that are being handed over. And uh, interestingly, of course, I mean, you could predict this. In, in all of the 14 projects that we studied, 
where were the greatest flows of information between designers? In the two or three days preceding the design meet coordination meetings. So here are the meetings, here are the design flows. And uh, it became clear that they're very unstable. There's no smooth flow of information. People are not sharing information and then coordinating and then continuing. They're waiting during the whole batch and then giving a whole pile of drawings. And now it's the other guy's problem and I can work on another project. Uh, but the idea would be that if we can begin to monitor these things and if we can transfer models and pieces of models rather than whole sets of drawings, we can smooth out those flows. Oh, this idea of clash checking is well established. It's one of the most obvious and basic ways to use the BIM, and, it, and it's very powerful. And so, of course, it reduces, um, reduces rework, reduces errors, uh, decreases cycle times. And then standardization is another key BIM principle. Uh, sorry, lean principle. And using building modeling, we can do this kind of thing where we can model in detail, pre-package components, pre-cut them all off-site, and then bring them in this way and assemble them without cutting, without whatever on site. And, and this, for example, applies to the block walls I showed you right in the beginning. If we could package them up, block them, cut them in the, pl in the factory, and then send the pallet in package, we wouldn't be working 32% of the time. We would be working a much greater percentage of the time devoted to value-producing work. Um, so standardization. 4D modeling allows us to plan out the work in much more detail, and so we get more stable work. Um, because we've planned it through, we've thought it through in more thorough ways. And then, of course, much more prefabrication, and this is becoming much more common. Uh, by virtue of being able to model a host of different systems that traditionally are built by different trades, and then producing them in a factory, and then like that, and then building, bringing them to site like that, and hoisting them into the ceiling and connecting them, uh, is becoming much more common. There are many examples of this now, all over. And here's a, a great one. I, I was hearing a little bit from... Um, Tom earlier about the new architecture building, and we didn't have time for me to mention that this is a building in New York City designed by uh, Jean Nouvel, and uh, the deal here is that all the windows are apparently different, but actually they're all just uh, versions of a the theme. They have a different angle, a different color, and a different size, but there are only three or four standard colors, sizes, and patterns in the whole building, but by randomly arranging them up and down the building, they get this. But the key, for me at least here, as an engineer, I have some appreciation of the architecture, but the key is how they were made. To make this on-site or even off-site in New York City is horrendously expensive. These panels were all, each, they were divided up, they were thoroughly designed, they were modeled down to the last screw, uh, and then they were produced in China, put in containers and shipped to New York City and assembled on the building, no problem. Zero errors. Of course, shipping panels of that size back to China to be fixed was not an option. So that kind of thing is becoming possible. Um, 2002, precast supervisor on site needs to call in the pieces to be assembled in the precast building the following day in a precast garage in a uh, parking garage in Atlanta. And that's how he does it. He lays out the drawings, he goes through it, he calls up the factory, he calls up the plant, the shippers, the, the truckers. And he figures out, and two or three hours later, he's got it done, pretty much. He's got his 12 pieces for tomorrow, and hopefully the right ones arrive, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. And nowadays, they're doing it like this. So they would have the tablet PC on the site. He's got the model. He's picking out the pieces he wants for tomorrow, and they're being delivered. And it takes five minutes, and it's thoroughly coordinated. Uh, an example from the Medellin Stadium project, where they're doing the same thing. And, and the pieces are all color-coded, and the whole supply chain tracking and assembly is really quite radically changed. In this case, they even put RFID tags on the pieces to be able to track them through. Um, so again, this notion of pulling materials and being able to uh, do them in that way is very significant. I, I'm going to skip one or two slides in order to get to the meat uh, of the thing. There are these um, safety analyses. We began uh, around this time, 2006, to think about how we could pull work by using visualization systems of this kind where we would communicate to all the trades what the status of the work was. And this went through some uh, two or three generations of attempts and trials to build these kind of systems that communicate information. Um, and that led to this Kanban concept, which is the core, perhaps, of what we're doing. Kanban is, a Kanban is Kanban, which is a lean concept of pulling work, and BIM. 
And the idea is, can we use the building models to pull the work to achieve the efficiencies we're trying to? Well, the main goals are to visualize the process, to visualize the product, to reduce the amount of work in progress, to report the status, and also there's this notion of language action and how people make commitments that gets uh, taken up with it. Part of the rationale here is this, if you want to teach people a new way of thinking, create software and other management systems that make them work in that way, and then they will in time understand what they're doing or not, but they will work in that new way. So part of the idea is to say, can we create these software systems that can help on-site and off-site to guide the work? Two main stages in the research that we envisaged in the beginning, defining the principles and then doing the evaluation. Well, the starting point is the last planner system, as I showed you before, with its master planning, look ahead planning, and weekly work plan. But the difference, one of the differences we're trying to make here is to introduce the planning and bring it through into what we might call real time. That in the daily work, we can still see what's going on, negotiate between contractors where necessary, between work teams, and then perform the work, and most importantly, report what is being done and what's not being done, and having the status of the project fed back into the system. There are two main indices we, we, we use. Maturity, how mature is a work package, and how important, and what's the priority of a work package so that we can get the, the, the pull. And uh, there are already, as I said, the process map is more complex, but there are four basic phases. And if I show you just those four quick phases, they're like this. The master planning, phase planning, weekly work planning, and then the actual workflow control, which is where I'll place the emphasis. Master planning, uh, you can already do this in building modeling. You can link it to the MS project or Primavera or whatever. You can link objects and create the master plan. That works quite well. The, the notion of how to do this with Canvim in the phase planning and the weekly work planning is that Every week, planners would sit around a table. They would lo be looking as a weekly work planning meeting at two screens. The first would show the building with all these task symbols. And uh, the second would show the locations and the time, much like a flow. And then it would start to pick up the problems, the conflicts, where space is, not, is being shared between teams, where teams can't occupy the same space. For example, like this. You might say, well, we see there's a conflict over here. Where do we have this? Uh, here. They're doing ducting work, but there's electrical work to be done in the same space, but there'll be scaffolding. So if there's scaffolding there, well, the trick would be within the meeting to throw up this image and say to the two guys, well, can you work in the same space, or should we change the schedule? What are the practicalities of the micro-planning of the work? And then in the production control, once it's all been set, they're reporting back into the system. Can work be started? Yes, they would press the go button. It's in progress. If they stop or complete the work, they're reporting it. And these are the concepts. These are the ideas. And we created a simple mock-up, PowerPoint mock-up, took it to different companies, uh, and tried to begin to understand with focus groups whether this could work or not. Well, that produced some results. It was encouraging enough for us to go ahead and build a prototype. So we built the prototype and began experimenting. And the prototype worked like this. In the exhibition room, we have a, a system like this set up and it's operational. You're welcome to try it out. But the basic idea is that it's communicating what the building looks like, what the work is. You can drill down and filter and navigate. But in addition to the building itself, we're also seeing the process. And each of these labels represents a particular task. So you can see that there are different tasks. If you were to select a task, it highlights the objects that are related to that task. And you can click on the task and get a uh, information about it and so on. And they have different symbols, but they're meant to be simple for people to use. So work that is ready and mature to be done would have a go. Work that's in progress and perhaps overdue. Work that's not mature, don't work there. Or, or I want to stop, or it's stopped or something, or it's being checked and so on. And so you can visualize both, the, as I said, the product information in different ways. Uh, you can then feed back into the process. You can say, yeah, I commit to begin this work. I'd like to begin it. I commit to doing it at a certain time. You can report a problem with the work. I had to stop because our workspace wasn't there and there was missing information. Now we press. Or I could say, yeah, I've completed such and such work. I had some problems, perhaps, or I had some issues, but I'm complete and I'm done. And in that way, the database is continually updated with the status of the process. And then... We went the next step and said, well, let's do some experiments and try this out on site. 
And so we set up the system, found a company to collaborate with on three towers, and began uh, signing up some of the crew leaders onto the system, training them in how to use it, and uh, set it up in a, a, I mean, it's an experimental project, so this is how it was set up on site with a, a big touch screen. And uh, this is more or less what it looked like. One of the problems we had is that we didn't have the budget, of course, to build the entire system with the weekly work planning and all. And so the weekly work planning was done in a more traditional, lean way with simple boards, uh, location boards. But for the first time, these guys were involved in detailed work planning. And then, once the work plan was prepared, they uh, began using the system to monitor what they were doing and to see what they were doing. Uh, it had to be done in multiple languages. Um, because work teams are from different places and different uh, uh, things. And then we set about three experimental periods, one simple observation, and then a first experimental trial and a third experimental trial, each separated by about a month, and to try to measure these basic measures of percent pan complete, labor stability index, which tries to measure how often teams are being brought to the site or taken away, uh, and other measures. And uh, whether surprisingly or not, the results came back after this enormous effort of numerous researchers and, and a lot of time and investment in the software and so on. And uh, we did find that the PPC increased and we found that the labor stability index improved. And yet, I came away from this with, not with a very good feeling. Uh, and the reason for that was that there were too many open questions. For example, we had come as an intense research team, and we'd be involved in, in the work during those weeks of experimenting and observing. Well, generally, when people are observed, they tend to work better. And in any case, a lot of the impact that we'd had with doing the weekly work planning may have had effect, which was not the effect of the Canberra monitoring and, and workflow uh, system, but simply the better planning. Now, how could we separate that out? Quite apart from which, um, Different trades had changed, crews had changed, the work was slightly different in each of those weeks. And as a researcher, it's problematic to come along and say, well, here are the results, isn't it great, we should all use these systems. So we said to ourselves, this has too many limitations. Um, a week is too, each experimental period was a week, it's too short. And I, I could read through them, but the, the real fundamental one is this last one. There are too many uncontrolled parameters on a construction project like that for you to come along with a particular intervention and then say, the difference between week one and week 10 is my system. There are other parameters, there are other things going on. There is learning curve, the project manager was ill one week, he was there the, next, the other week. Uh, some other teams were, uh, got a raise in salary in the first week, they didn't, all these things impact. And so, and the last part of what I'd like to tell you about, we said, well, how can we improve on the experimentation here uh, by using the virtual construction site? And so what we did here was we attempted to study the differences in the task selection behavior of crew leader subjects, who would be construction people who we would bring into the virtual construction site, set them up with this whole environment, and then ask them to perform work as though they were a whole crew, and monitor them over time and see whether with the system or without the system, what performance was, was improved. And of course, the major difference here is that here we can control all of the context parameters. All of the conditions on the site, we can make exactly the same for every subject, uh, and you'll see it in a moment. So the basic experimental design has it that we have an experimental subject, we have the researcher, the experimenter running the experiment, we have other trades. In this case, we have the experimenter being the drywall contractor doing partitions. And the other trades were the plumber and the electrician, and we used avatars to, to represent them and move around the site. That requires that you, you have the virtual reality software. It also requires that you do discrete event simulation in parallel to drive the whole thing and a database in the background. And then, of course, the test is, well, can they use this lean production control application and in the control, they would not use it, and in the experiment, they would use it. So that's the third software system, and those all need to be tied in together. So this is what the avatar would look like. It's not moving around. I mean, they do move, and they walk, and they do their plumbing and their electrical stuff. We had 10 uh, subjects, 10 uh, site supervisors, and they each did uh, an hour with 
the system and an hour without the system in varying uh, sequences, some did with first and so on. Um, their goal was to finish doing partition works in 16 apartments across the building and to do it in the shortest time they could. Um, and they worked again, as I said, with and without. This is what the setup looks like, the, the virtual site for this experiment. Um, they get these apartments, they get a set of drawings and designs, and they need to go out, and using the wand, they can point to the lines, and when they do, the walls are built, and the, and the, the, the drywall, the gypsum is added to one side or the other side. They can also demolish, and in many cases, they needed to do that, and so on. A quick movie that uh, shows how this worked. And here we're... Uh, so um, I've turned off the audio so that I can comment it through. So you see here, uh, the, this, the subject is coming along. He's uh, using the Kangman system. He's filtering it to say, where is the work that is mature? Where can I go? And I know that I won't run into the plumber, the electrician. There won't be scaffolding. There won't be material stored, and so on. So he should select from any of the go activities, not any of the no entry activities. So he can filter it out. He's deciding what he wants to do, and he's off to the building. Well, he stepped two meters into the building. And now he's in the cave, and he's going to navigate. He knows he's on floor number two, so he can figure out where he is within the building. He goes into an apartment. And as you can see here, he's clicking on the, uh, the markings to create the walls. In some places, there were extra markings. So in some cases, if they weren't following the plan, they did the wrong work. And that happened too. But you can see that they can then work and create the... Uh, the, the partitions. He's leaving them all open on one side because on his drawing he knows which walls require electrical and plumbing work. So he's leaving those open. Were he to close them, the, he would then call in the plumbers. They would come, see it can't be done, protest, go away. He would have to come back, demolish, and of course all those things create rework and, and issues. And they did, uh, indeed. And uh, so here we go. He's, he can have a look in this particular apartment. Has the plumbing work been done? Yeah, it's all there. OK, I can close up the drywalls. And then he would go back to the uh, system. And the first, he would log in. Uh, there he is. The other two are the uh, plumber and the drywall guy, uh, the plumber and the electrician. So he would have a look. He could then filter to see the task that he was working on. So he's here filtering and selecting only tasks that are in progress. So there's the one he's been doing. And he'll now report it complete. So he'll say, complete. I had some problem with something. And, uh, but nevertheless, I actually managed to finish that task. And that message is now in the system. Maybe an SMS reaches the, the superintendent who needs to come and check or something. But everyone in the project, on or off site, is now familiar with what's happened. And he would come back and report. So this gives you a sense both of how the system works, but also of the, uh, the experimental setup. So how does that help us? I mean, in terms of the usage, the model allows us to travel freely and safely within the building. I mean, uh, when we run experiments on site, we're bringing students into an uns essentially an unsafe environment. Um, here, we can do the things virtually. We've done a lot of research on construction safety. And there, in particular, the virtual site is a, a tremendous benefit because we can create dangerous situations and see whether people are able to identify the different hazards without putting them at any unnecessary uh, danger. An experiment in the, we can do in the virtual site like this in two hours, we can simulate roughly two weeks of work on site. You know, each click represents doing a whole wall. That might have taken two or three hours in practice, but it's three or four seconds in, in thing. And we're not actually interested in doing the work. We're interested in the interfaces between when you're doing the work. And, and that's where the, the interest is. So it's much more efficient. And, and as I said before, the major benefit of this kind of experimentation is that we can control the parameters. We can control whether the plumbers and electricians are going to behave well or not well, or, and so on. And the others that influence our subject's performance. So we get results of this kind, uh, the time, the simulation time, and then the apartment numbers. They're numbered 21 to 24, and so on, the four floors with four apartments on each floor. And you can see, in, you, you also have an exact record of what was done, because it's all being done against a database. So it's unlike on site, where you would have to have people observing and recording. Uh, and then you begin to see the patterns of behavior. 
where they worked, when they were able to call in the electrician and the plumber, and then when they were able to come back and complete the drywalls on the other side. None of them managed to complete all of the work. Um, typical result for an individual subject. The amount of wasted time, percent of time spent on work that was not ready. Uh, the productivity in, in their own value per hour. The work in unready apartments. And, and we had a point system where they were like paid for the work they completed. Uh, and the productive working time. That's simulated time. It's not real time, of course. And you can see that very typically these are the kinds of results that, that show the differences. And when you uh, accumulated over all the 10 subjects doing two experiments each, these are the kind of numbers. Um, productive working time. The, the, the earned value is increased. Work in unready apartments is reduced radically because they're able to know where apartments are mature as opposed to where they're not mature. And it's no longer this case of going up and down the building, figuring out where there might be work, where I sh might work, but then turns out the drawings weren't complete or, or the scaffolding was in my way or something else. Productivity and waste. A and a quick measure of how significant the differences were between the two populations of results. So, uh, they, were, they were all um, pretty significant. Now, again, the typical thing that we're able to track is this kind of chart where we see a long time and earn value that when you're working without the Kanban system, here in the red or in the green, you might be doing a lot of work. There's a lot of working time, but the value earned is a lot lower because you may not be doing the right work and because you're doing a lot of rework. Whereas with the, uh, when you're working with the system, your gross production is here, and, you, and your net value earned is over there. Getting near the end, there were situations where there was no work available, and so they were beginning to wait. And so you begin to see that opening up. But the main difference is that we're able to track that curve against that curve. And that's the impact on productivity and earning uh, on the site. And of course. Uh, we have a lot more confidence in these results than we would have in any kind of uh, on-site experimental results. Um, that, another thing that we picked up on is this, that what we, we've begun to call the low-hanging fruit behavior. You recall I mentioned earlier in my talk this idea of the ductwork people uh, going out and occupying space, because they, if they did that, they could be the first to build in a particular area, and that's more productive for them in terms of productivity and not interfering with other trades, well, we began to find very clear evidence of it, uh, consistent evidence. In the first half, when they were working without the system, as opposed to the second half, generally the amount of value earned was much higher in the first part because they would go and do all the big work and the little bits of walls and the closing up of, of partitions they would leave for the end. You know, because I, I, my earning rates should be fast, and then later I can come back and do all the fixes and, and little bits. Whereas when they worked with the system, it was much more steady. In other words, we were able to control them to go and work where the project needed them to work, to close out apartments and leave them and make them available for the following trades, rather than leaving bits and pieces of work unfinished in lots of different places. And that's one of the big benefits we can get by using flow control systems like that. So you see it here, the two typical results. Finally. Um, you know, we then, of course, each subject we were able to interview and discuss their impressions and, and feelings. To one extent, were you aware which apartments were ready? Uh, how confident were you about selecting the work? To one extent, were you aware where, where the plumber was, the electrician was? How often did you encounter obstacles? Was the system clear? And so on. Fairly consistently, um, their own sense of what was going on in the project was much stronger when using the system as opposed to without. And it's that situational awareness that, that partly allows us to have smoother workflows. And so perhaps for some um, conclusions and uh, concluding remarks, um, well, I'm convinced at least that BIM makes construction leaner. Whether you know anything about lean or not, if you're using modeling, chances are your pro project will be leaner. And the flip side is also true, that uh, if you do go for lean thinking and you are consciously trying to uh, manage projects and systems and design in lean ways, chances are you'll reach the conclusion that you need to introduce modeling at various points in time along the process. Um, they do offer a unique opportunity to change the industry, not 
only each of their own, but in concert one with the other. And I think that uh, it's fairly apparent through all the places we've seen that owners, uh, building clients, who are more sophisticated. I'm not talking about the one-off person who buys or builds a house or an apartment block or something. I mean, the institutional builders who, uh, uh, clients, who build over and over again, who build hospitals, schools, and so on, if they're able to become uh, leaders in this recognition, then they will be able to procure buildings for lower costs and in shorter times than they are able to do now. But it requires investment of effort and energy to change the systems. Um, we've talked about this uh, in various occasions yesterday and today, and I assume we will tomorrow and the next day in various meetings I have, that it's not only about the technology and the principles, it's the people, the organizations, the contractual relationships and everything else that create the right environment for all of this to work. And of course, when individual savvy owners begin doing this, it does have a changing effect on the players that they're impacting on, and that does ripple across an industry. And we've seen that especially so far. It's beginning in the US. Um, um, Matt Stevens here has done some work on uh, the maturity and so on, and you begin to see that happening. So the real challenge then is to learn how to exploit both the lean thinking and the building modeling for the benefit not only of their own, as their own, themselves as owners, but for the contractors, GCs, suppliers, and eventual clients and users. And perhaps really as the last uh, slide, I would add um, some comments about the research agenda, coming as a researcher and perhaps having a conversation about research. Uh, if we really want to see the modeling used, uh, not only in the design, but in the construction supply chains themselves, there are still a number of issues. and. Uh, any of these could be good uh, research topics. How do the contracting arrangements, how do the commercial terms impact and engender the collaboration that's needed so that we can do the virtual design and construction? Uh, what information architectures are needed? Because we need to convey not only, BIM is very good at the product modeling, it's not so good yet at the process modeling, so how can we introduce those aspects? And finally, if we do invent various systems and applications, and there, there are commercial packages, not quite like this, but various um, different ones becoming available, how can we figure out whether they are working, whether they're not working, whether they're beneficial or not? And so there's a fair amount of work to be done in that area. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Construction industry is a difficult industry in which to implement change. And you pointed that out very well. We deal with enormous, large, expensive, one-off um, products. And experimentation is, therefore, by definition, risky. But I think you've taken us through a very convincing explanation of how organization and process lead to different product. And in particular, from that, I think the question of how, if we want to implement change for better outcomes, the steps that we need to undertake, and not just looking at the different outcomes or the different products of how to get there, but paying attention more to the processes mm -hmm. and attending to those. But I was particularly taken with the way you wrapped up towards the end, you talked about the leadership in it. And it takes a leadership of an industry, of an owners. And that's something that's resonant with us, I think, because in our education, we're trying to encourage people to step up and take leadership in the processes of change. So it's very important for us to attend to that. It's not about the products alone or the process alone, but it's conceptualizing the opportunity and leading to it. And that, I think, is critical. One thing you've given all of us, I think, is a new piece of vocabulary. We'll all leave the room now. Cam Bim. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. So I've been asked to remind you on Thursday evening, there is an industry evening. Where is it? Uh, in um, Santa Craft Theatre, and we'll have a debate about the future of education. So it's Santa Craft Theatre Thursday evening.